heart of worship. This is written by Matt Redman, who is um, very popular, uh, most of you know, from England. Um, and I don't know how many concerts he's done and how many times he's sung, uh, his songs are sung. But uh, this was written from, a, from, from a, a man who performs all the time. And he, he said he didn't want his life to be about performance. I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's got to be all about you, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it when it's all about you. Go to the next slide, please, sir. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. So I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I was thinking of the song we sang before that, of the glory of God, holy, 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 Lord, you're holy. And we're not built to be able to see that and to ponder into it now. You... You've all been that place where that bright light comes in and you just can't comprehend it. You, you, you run from it. And I guess there are times that the glory of God is so, so different, so extremely different that we're not built for it yet. Our heart desires it, but it's awfully hard to comprehend something so magnificent, so, so different from me. And I'm grateful that we have a God that goes beyond our expectations and, and supersedes anything that our minds could even comprehend. Now unto him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above. I'm grateful for an exceedingly abundantly above God. I'm grateful that he is able to keep us from falling, from stumbling, from hurting ourselves, and from hurting his name and giving him a black eye and to present us spotless before the presence of the glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, our Father, our Savior, be glory and honor and dominion and power both now and forevermore. What a God that we have who, can, who is just so much beyond anything that we could ever uh, fathom or, or, or the scope of our thoughts even. But yet, Though we weren't built to fully comprehend it here, we were built to, to love it and to desire it here. And nothing else in this world will ever quench the thirst that we have for God and for purity and for holiness that is so much different. And we long for that. And I long more for that. And I desire more for that. And once you get a taste of it, the counterfeits do not, cannot, uh, they cannot compete. We, we want more of the real worship. Just a, a sermon or a song is not enough. Every breath should bring him honor and glory. The way that we do life, and life is difficult. Come on now, God left us here knowing that it would be difficult. He saved us here because he knew we would be inadequate to do it on our own. What a God that we have. What a glorious, glorious God that we have. In Philippians, open your Bible. We're going to talk about the hindrances to worship. There is much in the book of Philippians that I appreciate. Um, in chapter 3, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He is saying that there should be an attitude of overflowing of love for God that are not based upon your circumstances. He is saying that you should live a life so uniquely drawn to God that you're drawn away from this world and what this world is, is offering and, and what we can find ourselves trapped into. So he says, in this, let your heart be joyful to the Lord. Always. In the fourth chapter, in the fourth verse, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Can I say that's worship? 
To rejoice no matter the circumstance is worship. To have an accurate view of God in your circumstance is worship. To experience the love of God that makes us so much different from the world, to recognize that, to give him a tribute for that, is worship. To be able to see people the way he sees people is worship. To be able to fellowship with them the way God created us is worship. To be able to give someone a help up when they've fallen down is worship because it's done in the Spirit of God. Giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name is worship. Choosing to do the right thing at work when everybody else is taking shortcuts is worship unto God. Paying your taxes is worship. Being submissive to authority as the Word of God teaches us is worship. Cutting your grass is worship. Getting your hair cut. I'm, so, I'm three weeks behind in a haircut and I can't hardly stand it. And on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, I'm going to worship. I'm going to lose five pounds in one week, but it's all going to be for my hair. I feel like Samson, except I don't. To rejoice is what he's calling us to do. He says it all the way through the book of Philippians. In the first chapter, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How you live your life needs to be based upon not who you are, listen to me, but what Christ did for you, who he is. The value of the offering that he gave for us. If I'm living my life for me, that doesn't have much value towards this world. But to offer yourself worthy of what the cross of Calvary means is worship. It's worship. It's not a church activity. It's a heart activity. Getting up in the morning and having a cup of coffee, it's the next thing of blessing before you. Grab your cup of coffee, go grab your Bible and worship. Stay there until God turns loose of you. Don't turn loose of him before he turns loose of you. That's worship. That's worship. That constantly being aware of God, constantly being in thought with God, constantly being the seeker after God, constantly being aware of what He is doing. And, and it's not by accident that you're here. It's not by accident that you're in that place. But, but for such a time as this, he told Esther, Mordecai said, this is a, could be a very difficult time, but this is a time where we honor God now. That's worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the hottest of places that the world said, we will punish you, but it was worship. The new Christians who were told that they would be persecuted, told beforehand, and yet did not care. What you do, if it's against God, that's, that's up to you. But as for me, I cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. That's worship. It's not an activity of works. It's an activity of being connected to a holy God. He, he came to have a relationship like he did with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where they could just walk and, and be one with him. Sin separated that. Worship brings it back. We have a lot and I'm going to say this word wrong and forgive me, religiosity. 
We've allowed the things of religion to take us away from the one that religion is supposed to point to. So he says in chapter 3, he begins and he's kind of giving his resume there in the first six verses. Because the, the people who had come into the church at Philippi were telling them they didn't need to, to listen to uh, Paul. There were some other things that they needed to do. That's the things of the Nicolaitans that we talked about this morning. Be very careful of that. When somebody's trying to lord it over to you and to get you to fit them rather than fit the book, be very, very careful. But verse 7, he's, he says something I love. He says, what things were gained to me, this is the, the things that he had and he was born into and he had become and this was his resume. The thing that the world said brought him value to the world. He said, those things I counted loss for Christ. The things that the world treasured, he said, I lay those things aside. Those things don't, they don't help. They don't build up. That just makes the world smell like me, but life should smell like God. So he said, yet indeed I count all things, what's the word there? Loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. Here he is saying, I have a determined attitude that I'm never going to let anything get between me and my worship. No feeling, no person, no achievement, no religion. God didn't come to give us religion. He came to give us a relationship. A hot heart for God. So, in verse number 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, complete, mature. Here are the hindrances to worship. Number one, the attitude of I have attained. I call it the I got it. I'm there. I don't have to strive anymore. I don't have to be hungry anymore. I'm there. God is so pleased with me. What happens is in our walk with God, we slow down. And we slow down into the place that we stand and admire. The one thing I can tell you is that's a fact for sure. If you meet someone and they tell you, I got it, the one thing you know for sure is they don't. The thing that I am so blessed by is the people that I know of that are the closest to God know how little they really have. They know that every breath comes from God. Every beat of the heart comes from God. They know that all of their works are like filthy rags. But yet, here's the subtle thing that we have to walk about. Satan sometimes loves to get us away from worship by patting us on the back. Be very careful who's patting you on the back and what the result of that is. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. For those people that are so determined to read the Word of God through. Well, that's great, and that's wonderful, but what happens when you read it through? Start again, don't stop. Isn't it so easy to slow down? Isn't it so easy to be distracted and we're not hungry anymore? Why do you think fasting was introduced to us? Think about it. If fasting, when we are fasting, the purpose of that is to get us away from the distractions and when those things come upon our body, it turns our focus back upon God. 
You can get rid of the distractions in a hurry, can't you? But the comfortable person doesn't fast. Be very careful about this attitude of I have arrived. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. I'm going to cover this twice, but let me, let me just talk to you a little bit about this up front. It means to lean forward. To lean forward. You're going forward. Decades ago, I ran track, and we would get into the starting gate, and the whole point of that was to get ready so that when the, the blank gun would fire, we would shoot out and go. And when you got into that position, your ears were ready, your body was ready, and I was never fast, but I was quick. And I knew if I was ever going to win a race, I had to win it at the beginning. You've got to be ready every day. Come on now. Every day you've got to be ready to shoot out and go. You can't lag back. Well, yesterday I went to church. I don't have to do much today. Hold on. I heard Chuck Swindoll say something this week that blessed my socks off. He said, what if I could give you 86,400 pennies every day? By the way, your math's going real quick. That's $864. He said, I'll give you $864 every day, but here's the catch. He said, you have to use it up every day. You can't keep part of it and use it the next day. What you don't spend today is gone. Can never use it again. Could you spend the $864? And I'm hearing him preach this, and I'm going, amen. I mean, my mind went, went, went real quick. I'm like, this is over $315,000. Mark, I believe I can spend $315,000. Lynn and I could figure out a way we could spend $864 every day. Can I get an amen, Lynn? That's right. But then he went on to say this. He said, what if I gave you 86,400 seconds per day? or 1,440 minutes, or 24 hours, of which you're going to sleep one-third of it, eight hours, except for Lance over there. Got five girls and sleeping three, four hours a night. God help him. Amen. That's going to catch up with you. It will, it will. Now, hold on. Those seconds are gone. They're gone. You can't take them back. How many of y'all are going to get 86,400 seconds tomorrow? Me, Cheryl, I'm going to get them. If God tarries, I'm going to get all 86,400 of them tomorrow. But how many of them are, are, am I going to use? I think there needs to be an attitude of worship a pressing forward to God as you go to sleep, as you wake up, as you drink your coffee, as you drive to work, as you talk with people at work. If we had the umbrella of grace that covered us over 86,400 opportunities to take a breath and to live life for the glory of God, you're saying you're being legalistic. You're saying that all we need to... I'm saying I am a Christian set apart for God and there should be nothing in my life that does not have the impetus and the blessing of Christ on it. If you're mowing the grass, do it with Christ with you. Do it in a way that honors Him. Don't let anything get in the way. Corinthians tells us we're going to stand before God one day. The judgment seat of Christ. You will not be judged at the judgment seat of Christ by if you're a Christian or not. That's for a different judgment. The lost people will stand before the great white throne judgment. But every Christian will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not if you're saved, but what you've done with your salvation. God's not looking for works. 
He doesn't look, Samuel tells us, 16, he doesn't look on the outside of man. He looks at the heart of man. He wants to know, are you living your life loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength all your time? That's the goal. Can I say, I'm not there. You just heard your pastor say it. But I desire to be there. I've got hurts in my life. I've got hang-ups in my life. I've got issues that I'm battling. I don't know about y'all, but there are some issues I'm battling. I've been battling for years. If you think you got the perfect guy up here, you got the perfect bum up here. I, I know why Paul said what he said of, I feel like I'm chief among sinners. Because the, more I, the closer I get to God, the more he starts looking at areas of my life, and I want every area of my life to be under his lordship. So he says, I press on. And then he goes on to say, and forgetting the things that are behind you. Look what he says. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press on. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what's going to keep you from worship? Yesterday. In two ways. Number one, the failure of your yesterday. How many of y'all messed up? How many of you get reminded every day that you've messed up? How many of you have thoughts of when you messed up? How many of you have memories of when you messed up? How many of you have regret? How many of you... I'm, I'm serious, or haunted, or haunted. When you look at it and you say, how could I? Now, let me, can I sound like a preacher instead of the bum? I know my Redeemer lives. I know the pure blood of Christ that was shed for me cleanses me of all my sin. And I bask in the glory of every moment of my life, past, present, and future. It's not in how good I am, but how good the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary was for me. And I live under the umbrella of His grace. I have been baptized unto Him. I have been freed and freed indeed. And yet, the chatter of yesterday, the falsehood of thinking that we have to be perfect. If we could be perfect, then God would have saved us and took us to heaven because that's the only place where perfect people are. But evidently, He left us here Broken vessels, the only ones that God uses mightily are those that he breaks mightily, and that qualifies me. So I understand theologically that I have been forgiven, but I find myself continuously saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And in that moment, I need to take those thoughts captive, 2 Corinthians tells me. I need to, to let those things, put those thoughts back under him rather than being fresh on tearing me down. Satan loves to tear down. So the issues of yesterday. Now let me just bring this home for you and I'm going to move on. When you get to heaven... How much, of your, how much regret are you going to live with throughout all the eternities of heaven for all the failures of your past? Say it again. Say it louder. Say it like you mean it. That's right. So why should we now? When it comes up, we need to, as Romans tells us, the renewing of the mind. 
the renewing of the, not to be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to take those thoughts captive. We need to understand that when we're bringing those things to God, God's already forgiven it. God's already separated as far as the east is from the west. Not to be brought up in his presence again. If we come back to him and say, God, forgive me. I, it's like the old preacher said. He said he's going to look at you and say, what sin are you talking about? If he is good with forgetting it, we need to get about forgetting it. They're learning lessons of going forward. Learn from it. Grow from it. So when those times come, when those times come that you, you, you say, oh, how much I messed up. Say, Father, I know I messed up and I know I was wrong. What can I learn from that so that it can affect me today, so that I can bring you glory and honor today? And when you do that, listen to me, it's called what? Worship. Worship. What Satan means for evil, God can mean for good. But hold on. Not just our failures of our past keep us from worship, but listen to me. Oh, my goodness, the successes of our past keep us from worship. You know, Paul quoted his resume, but he quoted his resume to tell them, that means nothing to me. And I'm grateful that in your life, you can look back on, the, on, on your life and you can say, God used me mightily here. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that his grace? Isn't that his goodness? Glory unto him. Amen. But hold on. We're supposed to press on. One of the hardest things for churches is getting over a successful history. Always living in yesterday. I talk to Christians, and they want to talk about a time in their life that they were so grateful and all the wonderful things that the church did and all those things, and they say, if we could just get back and do. In my life, as I'm talking to people, Lynn, what year is it that they always look back on? I say it all, all the time. 72 is what I always say. 75 will work. For some reason, that seemed to be the heyday. So if we could just get back to the preaching style of 1972, if we could get back to the decor of 1972, if we could get back to the programs of 1972, if we could get back to the singing of 1972, if we could dress like we did in 1972, I do not want a leisure suit again. Can I get an Amen. I want to stay in the present tense. I want to stay where God meets you. God can't meet you in yesterday. You can learn from your yesterday. But God wants to meet you in 2020. And one of the things that hinders people from, people from worship is they can't get back to where they used to be. It's impossible The children of Israel who lived in slavery, it was not good. When God was taking them to the promised land, what did they want to do? Go back to Egypt. You cannot go forward if you're looking back. I'm sorry. You must get your eyes forward. You must get your eyes on what God's doing in your life now. I'm sorry you're not 20 anymore. When you're 20, you can do so much. Lance, you do have energy. Bless you in your 30s. You can accomplish great things. But listen, I'm not 20 again. I don't bounce like I used to. I've got to make the most of where I am today. Because when I stand before God, I'm going to have to be accountable for the 86,400 seconds that God gave me today. I can't live yesterday's. Those seconds are gone. They can't be recouped. You have to get beyond the failures of yesterday. You have to get beyond the successes of yesterday. And you've got to have a, a desire to go forward. A vision for God to go forward. 
I believe that it's born of the Spirit of God. There's something that happens in our spirit when the Holy Spirit meets us there and our spirit says, I hear you, Lord. In the book of Revelation, when he spoke to those seven churches, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying into the churches. When we meet God in the present tense, and we hear the Holy Spirit, and we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, there's something amazing that happens to us. We start to get invigorated and excited and, and energized to go forward. I don't care where you are in your stage of life. God has a purpose for you for today, a purpose for good, a purpose for benefit, a purpose where God can get great glory. Now, it might not be your standard of success, but we need to follow his standard of success. Press on. Don't slow down. Do not take your foot off the accelerator. Go forward. Want more. Desire more. Be passionate about more. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The upward call of God in our lives. The upward call that Jesus is saying, children, there's a work to be done. Worship. Verse 15, you there? Therefore, because of these things, let us, by the way, that means all of us, as many as are mature, that is the word complete. That means it has been th through the things that you've been through, God is doing a perfecting work in your life. As many as are mature, have this mind. Think this way. Rejoice in your opportunities. Worship God in the right now. Every day. We get to put yesterday behind us. Isn't that a good thing? Every day we get to say, yesterday is done. God, forgive me for that stuff where I failed you. Lord, walk with me. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Make me a blessing to someone today. Father, may your yes be my yes. May your no be my no. Father, may I have no agenda other than your agenda. Let my light so shine before men. Every day we get that opportunity. And we'll take advantage of part of it. And sometimes we'll just let that pitch slide by. And when we do, Take note of it. Adjust. Lord, I missed that one. I missed that opportunity. Forgive me, Lord, but Lord, give me eyes. Give me a burden. Give me an opportunity. Give me boldness, Lord. Let us worship. Let us worship. How sad it would be if we would come into this building for a few hours a week and that's the only worship we had. How sad that would be. When truly we were built with a heart that wants to take all 86,400 seconds and yield them unto him. And when we do fail, we are forgiven. The parent doesn't kick the child when he's down, but he helps him up. Learn from it. Let's go forward. Let's go together. That's the good, good father we have. How simple to just understand that life is supposed to be about him. Heads bowed. Teach us, O oh Lord, what it means to love. Teach us, O oh Lord, to 
take advantage. Take us where we are. Grow us into what we need to be. Father, I'm grateful that you're patient and long-suffering and kind. Father, uh, that was a great church that we talked about this morning, Ephesus, a church that you love. But Father, you wanted them to remember from where they had fallen and get back to loving you with all their heart. May it be that way in us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you follow after us tomorrow and remind us. May you, you remind us that we need to talk. May you remind us that we need to listen. Father, put a, a spirit within us that would help us to want to do better. Father, even as we come in the morning to, to have a pastor's brunch and just have fellowship together and enjoy what you've given, even that, may that, Lord, be a time of worship, a time of laughter. But, Lord, you created us with a spirit that wants to laugh, so make it a time of worship. Change our understandings. Give us a heaven day. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we were fit for your hand. So pick us up and use us. What a joy that would be. Let us just sing something unto you to bring you praise and glory. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Tell the Lord how you feel about him right now. Let's just take a moment of worship right now. Thank him for loving you just the way that you are. Tell him how grateful you are that he's your Lord and your Savior and your Master and your King. Ask him to draw you close. Lord, get the, get the wax out of our ears so that we can hear you. Take our hardened heart and make it soft again. Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say, we're listening. And those things that he's putting in, in your mind right now, say, yes, sir. I'm listening. Yes, sir. Father, teach us what it means to walk with you like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Even as we walk through this sin-filled world, thank you, O oh God, that you are Emmanuel, that you are with us. Thank you for receiving our prayers and our worship. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.